today it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Navin uh, Sridhar. Uh, so Navin uh, did his undergraduate studies at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. Uh, he graduated in uh, 2018 and since then he's at the Columbia University New, New York where he's working with uh, uh, Lorenzo Cironi and uh, Brian Metzger on several uh, aspects of high energy astrophysical phenomena. And so, uh, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about his uh, latest uh, very exciting work. So, uh, Naveen, uh, without further ado, the stage is yours. Um, thank you, John, for uh, the introduction and thanks, Constantinos and John, for. Uh, inviting me to the uh, Institute of Astrophysics at Fourth for uh, discussing our recent research on uh, on uh, whether FRBs could be observed from XRBs. FRB standing uh, stands for F fast radio bursts, and XRBs are X-ray binaries. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is a work that I did with Brian, Paz, Ben, uh, Matthew, Renzo, Lorenzo, Cironi, and Constantinos, who is here right now. Uh, fast radio bursts are mysterious radio signals of millisecond durations. Uh, so uh, from, from their duration, we guess that it requires a small emitting source, like say a neutron star. And they are extremely luminous uh, of the order of 10 to the 37 to, to 10, 10 to the 46 or per second. And uh, their, their brightness temperature of around 10 to the 35 Kelvin requires coherent radio emission mechanism. Uh, and uh, by looking at by by looking at the uh, by looking at, at the 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 time at which different uh, uh, different frequency component of bursts arrive at uh, uh, along along the duration of a burst, one can infer the dispersion measure. That is uh, a measure of uh, the uh, column density of the intervening medium, the uh, IGM uh, and ISM, and by measuring the dispersion uh, measure, one in people used to infer that uh, FRBs typically came from extra galactic distances of uh, of, of uh, redshifts up to z equals three. And uh, another property of FRBs is that uh, they can repeat, and some of the repeaters can even be periodic, with a periodicity with a periodicity of anywhere between a few days and several months. Uh, another intriguing property of FRBs is that within a given period, they arrive in bunches over some active duty cycle. That is, if the period is a, a hundred days, then we see bursts. We, we see bunches of FRBs arriving for a few days, uh, and that's how the periodicity operates. And this active duty cycle can be anywhere between uh, ten percent or even as long as fifty percent of the entire uh, period periodicity period period of the uh, cycle. Uh, another aspect of FRB is uh, that within a given active cycle, say if the FRBs arrive in bunches over a few days, within that few days, the bursts that peak at higher frequencies arrive earlier. And then after a few days or a few uh, weeks, the bursts that peak at uh, lower fre frequencies arrive. Um, so the active phase, and, 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 uh, along with which the bursts that peak at uh, higher frequencies that arrive earlier, they arrive only for a short span of time compared to the bursts that arrive later, which peak at lower frequencies. Uh, this is a frequency dependent active phase windows that was uh, recently discovered for uh, an FRB. So the earlier uh, plot by Pastor Marazvela that I showed here this corresponds to several bursts. However, if you just look into one single burst, even within one single burst, if you correct for the uh, for all for all the possible scattering and dispersion measures, even within a single burst, you see that the high frequency component of the burst arrives earlier, and then arrives the low frequency component. Uh, this is uh, this is colloquially called the sad trombone uh, structure of FRBs. So these 
observational features are extremely powerful in constraining various properties of FRBs, various progenitor models of FRBs. And they have even uh, eliminated many theories of FRBs and they require uh, FRB models to now uh, explain all these features. So the best studied engines of FRBs are based on magnetars. Why? Because magnetars models can account in a natural way uh, for many of the observed properties of FRBs, including their short uh, millisecond time scales, large energetics, uh, uh, potentially high polarization, ability to recur, etc. cetera. Uh, because many magnetars are uh, known to be flaring and such flares that last for a very short duration can give rise to uh, repetition and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, magnetars can also be hosts of a, a variety of uh, emission mechanisms. They can, the, the flares can drive shocks, um, uh, electrons and positrons can travel along the field lines of magnetars and can produce curvature radiation and the uh, strong field lines can reconnect and that can give rise to uh, coherent emission and so on and so forth. Uh, another aspect of magnetar that makes it a very good uh, candidate for FRB engines is that the locations of FRBs are consistent with uh, core collapse supernovae, which are also the birth sites of uh, typical magnetars. And furthermore, from the uh, galactic event, that is last year, uh, during April, nearly one year ago, uh, right now, uh, FRB 200428 was observed from a galactic magnetar. So up until then, FRBs were known to be cosmological events. And this was a watershed moment in FRB uh, studies uh, because that's the closest and uh, closest FRB ever observed from our own galactic source. And that's a smoking gun evidence that FRBs can indeed be produced by magnetars. But the question still remains if magnetars are the only sources of FRBs and that's, that still remains open. Uh, there are some reasons why we need to look beyond canonical magnetars. So by canonical magnetars, I, I mean here the ones that are formed from a supernova event and they are slow spinning ones. Um, for example, if you take the activity of, uh, a mag of, a, of a typical galactic magnetar, they are not really active enough. By activity, I mean the flaring cycles. They're not really active enough to explain very active FRB sources like FRB 121102. And this is, a, this is a source that repeats very frequently and the galactic magnetars are not uh, such frequent flare emitters. That's a drawback. Uh, and then, uh, uh, there are some models of magnetars that invoke precision to explain the periodicity that is observed in, from FRBs. These processing models predict a second shorter periodicity from the neutron star rotation itself uh, that should be detectable in the FRB pulse train. However, uh, again, no such intra-window periodicity is observed uh, in FRBs, which sort of disqualifies many precision-based uh, FRB magnetar models. Uh, there are some models that invoke extremely long duration uh, spinning pe pe spin periods of uh, magnetars, like, like a few thousand days, for example, and such magnetars are not really observed yet. And furthermore, uh, the limits that are placed on uh, local scattering, absorption, and dispersion measure variation suggest that, uh, from the recent study by Pastor Mara as well, it suggests that uh, FRB pulses are, at least from some sources, are not really surrounded by any dense supernova-like remnant, which is expected from a young processing magnetar. Um, so if you look at the energy budget, uh, a magnetar with a typical energy of say 10 to the 50 erg can produce at most around 10,000 FRBs with a luminosity function similar to uh, FRB 121102. Uh, at an efficiency of say, 10 to the minus five. Uh, this FRB 121102, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry about that, uh, my PowerPoint crashed.
Okay. Uh, is it is it back up again? Can you all see it? Uh, yes. We, we okay. Can, uh, see awesome. Now. awesome. So uh, this FRB well uh, um, 2 uh, has a rate of say six bursts per day seen on an average from the source, and uh, at most twenty thousand such. And, and, and since its discovery in uh, 2012, I guess, around 20,000 such bursts uh, should have been emitted by the source. And if it were, pro if it were uh, produced by um, a magnetar, uh, then it should start showing some secular changes to its luminosity function, and it should stop very soon. And uh, no such changes are seen facing the luminosity function of 1102. Um, another point is that uh, there is some inconsistency of location of uh, magnetars and FRB sources within host galaxies. Um, I'll come to that very soon. Uh, so here I have made a little footnote here uh, saying that if the magnetar is formed due to merger events, uh, the non-canonical ones, merger events say binary neutron star mergers or neutron star white dwarf mergers, then that magnetar could be highly active and uh, it can also be consistent with, a, uh, with, with the locations of, uh, locations of FRBs. Uh, however, we have not convincingly observed any uh, magnetar born out of such merger systems. So these are still exotic objects. So speaking of locations of magnetars and FRB sources, um, recently, an FRB called 1809-16 was observed using Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, yeah, so this is the galaxy. And what you see here is a zoom in of that, of the region where the FRB is seen. The little green dot where the arrow points at is the location of the FRB. And the dark region here uh, is the nearest star forming region. Uh, you see a small offset between the nearest star forming region and uh, the location of the FRB. This is a crucial detail. Uh, why? That's because during the birth, magnetars and neutron stars are shot with velocities of a few hundred kilometers per second due to their natal supernova kicks. Going by this, a magnetar or a neutron star would need a few, a few millions of years to traverse the distance at which FRB 1809-16 is from its nearest star forming region, which is the presumed birth site of FRBs of magnetars. So the offset between the nearest star forming region and the FRB is around a few hundred parsec. And uh, it requires a few million years to travel that distance given the natal peak velocities. This is problematic for uh, models that require young magnetars uh, to, to power FRBs because these magnetars that are invoked to power FRBs are quite young, like 10 years to a few centuries year old. And uh, since such sources are uh, invariably found near the, the birth sites, which are the star forming regions, um, this particular observation uh, uh, hints that probably not all FRBs are necessarily produced by young magnetars. However, this required time scale of a 5 million years to traverse that distance um, that is taken to attain that offset of a few hundred parsec is consistent with typical X-ray binaries would say, uh, for example, a 20 solar mass post-main sequence companion star undergoing mass transfer. Um, so the uh, advancement from such recent observations and some of those sticking points that I mentioned with magnetars uh, motivate, motivate us to understand X-ray binaries better and seriously start evaluating the prospects of accreting compact objects uh, to power FRBs. Um, any questions up until now before I move on to a uh, slightly different one? Okay. So from here on, I will motivate you why X-ray binaries can be good candidates for FRBs. By X-ray binaries, I mean accreting compact objects. And uh, what are the conditions that they need to meet in order to emit something uh, similar to an FRB? And if such conditions can be met 
by uh, any of the accreting compact object binaries. So typically X-ray binaries uh, can fall into a transient category or persistent accretors. Uh, these, uh, they, they undergo something called outbursts during which the luminosity, X-ray luminosity increases and decreases over a period of a few months. And uh, during such outbursts, the, uh, the, the uh, nature of X-rays that we receive from the X-ray binary changes they, during the onset of an outburst, the X-rays are hard. And then during the peak of an outburst, the X-rays are soft. And then once again, during the fading phase of an outburst, the, the X-rays are again hard. So it goes through this hard, soft, and hard state uh, transition. In, order, in addition to such state changes, uh, X-ray binaries also emit jets. And uh, the jets are also predominantly of uh, two kinds. One is a steady jet uh, that happens during the fainter states of an outburst. Also, like I said, they are typically the harder states. And the other type of jets are the transient or flaring jets that typically happen during the bright states of an outburst. The steady jet that, that you see here as the light blue colored ones are typically slower. And the transient episodic these flaring jets are typically faster compared to these steady jets. So you expect that these faster jets uh, uh, finally overtake the slow jets or ram onto the slower jets that are ahead of it. Um, so uh, there are some uh, interesting evidences from galactic sources. One source, one such source is SS433. Um, so the GIF that you see here, it shows the uh, jet that is processing over a period of around 40 days. So the period of the, the precision period is around more than 150 days, but you just see uh, this uh, movie captured over 40 days where the direction in which the flares are emitted continually change uh, due to what we think is uh, uh, the inner disk lens thinning precision. Uh, so you, you see these blobs of radio jet, uh, we are going to call it as plasmoids here. And uh, you can also notice that uh, these plasmoids are uh, brightening when at, at some point uh, from their injected location and these brightenings, brightening events could be caused due to um, some uh, shock and uh, jets are caused you, and, and these shocks can be, and, and these magnetized shocks can mediate what is called a synchrotron maser uh, instability. Uh, so I, I'll quickly go through what a synchrotron maser is and how it is relevant to an FRB here. Um, so you have a magnetized shock, you have an upstream here, the shock is moving from left to right, and you have downstream here. Uh, BU stands for the upstream field, you have downstream field. And the electrons and positrons from the upstream, they gyrate uh, coherently in the shock magnetic field. And the shock particles, they form an unstable ring-like structure, a soliton-like ring-like structure in the momentum space. Uh, so this is XY momentum space. And then what happens is, uh, yeah, so this ring-like structure that is formed is unstable. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a population in. It's a, it's, it's a pop, This is an example of a population inversion that you see in different lasers. Uh, so this population inversion is uh, unstable, and uh, this is continuous, continuously replenished by the upstream particles that enter the magnetized shock, and then uh, these unstable structures collapse. And this gives rise. This, this can give rise to coherent electromagnetic waves. Uh, and uh, first principle particle and cell simulations of such magnetized perpendicular shocks. So here, the geometry of the magnetic field is, is such that they are perpendicular to the uh, perpendicular to the direction of the shock. Such. Uh, perpendicular magnetic shocks can give rise to uh, FRB-like pulses, and they have been verified using fixed emissions using BZ-EY component, and the fluctuations that you see here correspond to the 
uh, electromagnetic waves. So this is the mechanism uh, that we invoke um, in order to uh, in order to see if um, if accreting compact objects can give rise to FRBs through their jets. So what is the mechanism? Uh, what is the um, overall geometry that we are envisioning here? So you have uh, a central black hole with a spin axis pointed in this direction. And then you have a companion star. It undergoes a thermal time scale uh, mass transfer into the black hole at a rate, say, exceeding the Eddington rate. And uh, the super Eddington, so yeah, this forms the binary system uh, with an orbital uh, angular momentum at some other angle uh, tilted from the spin axis of the black hole. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, the super Eddington accretion flow is radiatively inefficient, which leads, leads to the puffing up of inner accretion disk, as you see here. And this leads to powerful outflows in the form of accretion disk winds. These winds can therefore uh, reduce the accretion rate uh, closer to the black hole compared to what is, uh, what is given out by the companion star. These mass loaded disk winds also play an important role in uh, collimating uh, or shaping up the polar accretion funnel. This gives rise to the shape or the collimation of the shock. So you have, so of the jets, sorry. So you have the jets formed and then uh, the blue region corresponds to the steady jets that we saw earlier. And the uh, red region corresponds to the shocks that are caused when a flaring jet or a, or a flare corresponding to the uh, transient jet hits onto the earlier, slower moving steady jet. That's, that's what is depicted in this, uh, by this red color uh, shock here. Um, so coherent radio emission can be generated uh, either via say synchrotron maser emission um, at, at the shock front or say during uh, reconnection events also. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, the FRB that is emitted, it, it is radiated along the uh, axis of the jet. Uh, and uh, note that this shock occurs and the FRB is emitted at uh, several astronomical units, several orders of magnitude larger than the uh, scale of a black hole. And at this, at this radius, we show that the environment is uh, extremely tenuous and the effects of opacity and induced Compton scattering is negligible uh, such that the low frequency radio pulses can uh, easily escape the medium. So the jet is uh, uh, aligned with the inner angular, uh, so the jet is aligned, is, is aligned with the uh, uh, in angular momentum of the inner disk and it is misaligned with the uh, spin axis of the black hole. And this can uh, give rise to lens string precision of the jet around the uh, spin axis of the black hole. So if the FRB emission is uh, coming along the jet axis, then due to the precision, the FRB emission will also eventually persist along the, uh, across the spin of the black hole. So this is what we, we invoke in this model uh, to be causing uh, the, the precision of the, or, or the periodicity observed in FRBs. Yeah, so this is the uh, overall model and the duty cycle here is, uh, is given by the, the opening angle of the jet and how far, how far the uh, jet is inclined away from the black hole spin axis. So um, with this, we look into uh, the other burst energetics and the requirements. Um, so what you see here is the observed luminosity in y-axis and duration of the burst width in x-axis of repeating and non-repeating FRVs as filled and non-filled gray circles. The, uh, um, the top uh, ax, the the top X-ray, the top X-axis depicts the characteristic minimum time scale of our energy released from a black hole engine, which is set by the light crossing time of the innermost stable circular orbit. 
uh, and the colored contours depict the Eddington scaled mass transfer rate that is required to produce a given accretion luminosity. So in order to produce a uh, luminosity of 30 to the 40 seconds, uh, and for a, for, a, for a given duration of an FRB, you can figure out what should be the mass transfer rate. So just by looking at this, uh, when you place the observed FRBs in this map, we see that the non-repeaters preferably occupy a high luminosity N, uh, and uh, the repeaters preferably occupy the lower luminosity N. And the vast majority of accreting galactic uh, neutron star black hole sources reside in long-lived X-ray binary systems with mass transfer rates at uh, at or below the Eddington rate, which, however, cannot explain most of these bright FRBs. So we need super Eddington uh, rates. And uh, stable thermal timescale mass transfers, in fact, capable of generating sustained levels of super Eddington accretion. Uh, this can occur when an uh, evolved massive companion star undergoes gross lobe overflow when it is on its way to becoming a, a giant star, that is, upon crossing the Hertzsprung gap. Um, however, for uh, stable super Eddington accretion, the disk winds carry a lot of matter away, and uh, as we saw earlier, only a fraction of what is emit what is emitted, what is uh, not emitted, what is uh, uh, given by the companion star reaches the black hole. So if we also include these disk outflows, the black hole will re only receive a fraction of what was accreted, and that sets a limit on the maximum achievable luminosity from a uh, stable accretion system, as, as we show here by the dash the, the dashed lines. We still need a lot more accretion luminosity to explain these FRBs here. Is that possible? Well, sometimes. Um, uh, for example, if and when the companion star's stellar envelope becomes fully convective, uh, approaching the Hayashi track, the adiabatic response of the star to mass loss would be to shrink its Roche lobe, and this can lead to what is what is uh, known as the dynamically unstable ma mass transfer. Um, and such unstable mass transfer can, uh, in fact, uh, so the, these these phases last for shorter duration. However, they can uh, they can explain uh, the uh, more luminous FRBs due to their uh, increased accretion luminosity. Uh, such unstable mass transfer events can uh, later manifest as common envelope events, uh, where the black hole where the entire system is engulfed uh, in gas and ultimately precluding the clean environment necessary for FRB formation. And finally, the companion star is engulfed completely by the black hole. So, uh, yeah, many such uh, stringent conditions are uh, are needed to be met by X-ray binaries if they were to produce FRBs. Um, uh, some good candidates for them are uh, ultra-luminous X-ray sources, ULXs. So, if FRBs arise from mass transferring binaries similar to ULXs then uh, they might be expected to occupy a similar um, host galaxy and locations uh, within their hosts. Um, within the hosts of, so the hosts of FRBs and ULX, if you look at the star formation rate here, uh, the hosts of FRBs, the orange ones, and ULXs, the green ones, are generally forming stars at lower rates than the normal galaxies, uh, as you see from the primer sample here, uh, the black ones, uh, compared to the uh, background galaxies. Uh, and if you look at the mass, the, the mass of the FRB host seem to be relatively uh, smaller compared to the mass of ULX hosts. Um, however, comparing the FRB host galaxies to nearby, uh, so the FRB host galaxies are, are at giga parsec scales, and comparing them to um, nearby galaxy properties such as ULX hosts at a few tens of mega parsec can be problematic due to uh, the cosmological evolution effects, particularly, say, the shift in the star formation to lower masses with decreasing redshift. Um, on the other hand, ULX surveys are also systematically biased against 
low mass galaxies due to various selection effects. Uh, if you look at the metallicities, FRB and ULX hosts, uh, host galaxies prefer, prefer low metallicities. They are low metallicity hosts. However, FRB hosts do not exhibit as strong of a preference for uh, low metallicities as say long duration GRVs or super luminous supernovae hosts. Uh, the prevalence of ULXs at low metallicities is uh, sort of understandable given the prevalence of more massive black holes at low metallicity. So if you look at the offsets, uh, the peaks of the uh, offsets of FRBs, orange and ULXs uh, do seem to overlap well with each other. Uh, of course, there's a, the, uh, the, the sample of FRBs is much smaller. So uh, there are, uh, uh, so they can possibly occupy the, uh, the uh, larger offsets as we see from a spike here. So, uh, so with these uh, striking similarities, we look further into other aspects of ULXs and uh, further develop our model based on that to explain other FRBs. Uh, if you look at the periodicities, there can be two periods in the system. One is the orbital period. The other one is the length spinning position of the inner disk in X-ray binaries. And we think that the jet follows the uh, length spinning precision uh, period, which can last from a few days to a, to a few thousand days. Uh, so we establish a relationship between the orbital period and the length spinning precision period, uh, which, is, which we show here. Uh, in X axis, you see the orbital period and Y axis show the precision period for, uh, for different properties of the system, that is for different black hole spin uh, from 0 0.4, for, yeah, for 0 0.3 to 0 0.9. Um, and then binary mass ratio given by Q from 1 to 0 0.1. And then the mass of the uh, central black hole from 10 to 10 to the 4. Uh, we show here what should be the precision time scale, length string precision time scale given, uh, given an orbital period. Uh, the thickness of the bands here, they indicate the allowed range of uh, inner disk preci precision periods for a given orbital period uh, when you also factor in the uh, uh, uncertainty associated with the mass loss rates. So you can assume this band to be like error bars in some sense, or uncertainty uh, in the precision period. So we collected the ULX sources, the green squares here, so with known orbital periods and an observed superorbital modulation. Um, here we interpret the superorbital modulation to correspond to the length clearing precision period. And the superorbital modulation seen here uh, in the current sample of ULXs can explain the range of observed periodicity in FRBs with different orbital periods. So uh, the uh, ULXs with different orbital periods from say a few days to a few tens of days can um, explain the, the periodicity observed in FRBs if we interpret the periodicity to be coming from the length during precision time scale. Uh, and independently, we also, we also show that uh, ULXs are likely to be extreme mass ratio binaries uh, that is falling in the blue band uh, with a much smaller mass ratio or equivalently intermediate mass uh, X-ray binaries. Uh, so uh, I'll come back to this chromatic properties now because this is a very crucial aspect that has uh, that has uh, uh, refuted several models of FRBs. So like I said before, you see uh, within a given active window, the, the bursts that peak at higher frequencies, they arrive earlier. And after a while, the bursts peak at, that peak at lower frequencies are seen to uh, arrive. Uh, I'll use this cartoon to explain how uh, this observation can be explained using our model. So the FRB emitting flare, ejecta, is launched ballistically outwards along the axis of the jet. In the synchrotron maser scenario, 
the peak frequency of the radio emission scales with the property of the FRB gener generating flare, uh, under, which is subscripted with F, luminosity of flare. And then it also depends upon the upstream medium, which I have subscripted with Q here, luminosity of the upstream medium, the Lorentz factor of the upstream medium, and the magnetization of the upstream medium. Uh, these quantities determine at what frequency the FRB peaks uh, in synchrotron maser uh, scenario. MHD simulations of relativistic magnetized jets uh, have shown that the jet pointing flux is concentrated in a hollow cone around the jet spine. So the jet is structured about its axis, that is along the theta direction as shown in the figure above. Uh, if you look at the upstream medium here, the uh, Lorentz factor uh, is much is, is is peaking at some somewhere between the spine of the jet and the sheath of the jet, and the luminosity of the upstream medium uh, is lowest, or the power of the upstream medium is lowest near the spine of the jet, and it peaks near the sheath of the jet, and therefore uh, it, uh, the FRB emission frequency also changes depending on where it is emitted from. That is where, how far away from the jet axis the FRB is coming from. Um, so if the FRB emission is coming from the edges of the jet with a higher Lorentz factor, with a higher gamma Q, it's going to be at lower frequencies. And if the emission is coming from the core of the jet with a lower upstream uh, Lorentz factor, lower gamma Q, it is going to, the, the uh, FRB is going to be at higher frequencies. This angular structure determines the emission frequency of the FRB. The emission comes out at a uh, radius larger than the shock deceleration radius, uh, which again depends upon the upstream quiescent jet properties. So our deck, it, it goes as the upstream jet properties. Due to the structural nature, this radius where the FRB is emitted is shorter for flares interacting with the spine of the jet, the, the central spine of the jet, compared to the interaction produced near the edges. So the, uh, so the low frequency bursts are uh, emitted at much larger radius than the high frequency bursts, which are emitted around the spine at much smaller radius. Uh, so this can, um, yeah, and so, so the high frequency bursts are emitted earlier than the low frequency bursts, which can uh, also explain this particular uh, observation of high frequency bursts arriving earlier than the low frequency ones. Also, the burst width is determined by the radius of the emission. So we predict that uh, at lower radius, uh, the high frequency bursts that are emitted here should be shorter in burst width compared to the uh, low frequency bursts that are emitted at much larger radius. Also, the uh, quiescent jet cavity, uh, the blue ones, is bent towards its earlier orientation uh, due to the drag of the processing displacements. This curvature that we are envisioning is not imaginary. Uh, so the observations do suggest a curved quiescent jet cavity uh, so this is again an actual VLBA image of the of the COPS crew pattern of the inner jet displacements, uh, and uh, as you see here, such uh, curvature of the upstream jet is actually observed. Uh, it's an observed phenomenon. And uh, if the outflow is directed across a narrow range of angles, that is along the core or the spine of the jet, this could potentially lead result in shorter phase window for them. And, uh, and the bursts interacting with a much wider region of the jet can uh, interact for a longer time and can, give, can, and can give rise to a larger phase window for the burst. That is, the low frequency burst can arrive for a longer time and the high frequency burst that arrive earlier will only arrive for a shorter time. Um, so what are the predictions that come along with this model? There, there are multiple, uh, uh, counterparts that we can expect along with an FRB emission here. One, you can expect a persistent emission uh, due to shock ionized parsec scale uh, nebula that are that are inflated by the jets. 
uh, and then you can of course also expect uh, X-ray uh, X-ray emission due to the ULX themselves if the FRB is emitted from if the source is uh, at, at, at nearby distances. And then you can also have post FRB transient. That is, once the FRB life life, life cycle is, com is complete, you can uh, expect a luminous red novae that happens after uh, after an unstable mass transfer phase or after a common envelope uh, phase. And such luminous red novae um, can uh, uh, can can be at around say 10 to the 39 to 10 to the 41 or per second at luminosity uh, at at 150 megaparsec. They would correspond to a magnitude of 21 to 22. Uh, it would be hard to detect with current facilities. However, perhaps with say the future ones like Vera Rubin Observatory, um, such uh, luminous red novae can be de detected uh, from an FRB source at around a few hundred megaparsec. And then along with an FRB, you can expect contemporaneous uh, emission from incoherent thermal cyclotron uh, uh, mechanisms, ranging from optical to gamma ray emission. And the frequency of such incoherent thermal synchrotron emission de depends upon the upstream, uh, upstream medium's properties on its composition and so on and so forth. Uh, and another prediction is uh, a narrow active window for bright bursts because the brighter the FRB is, they must be produced by uh, much higher accretion luminosity, uh, much higher mass transfer rates, and the, they require much uh, stronger beaming. And uh, the stronger the beaming is, the narrow the active window of, uh, of the FRBs would be. And as a consequence, you would have a lower probability of detecting repetitions from brighter bursts. And that is also probably why, uh, if you remember, we, we, see, we see that most of the bright bursts are non-repeaters, or, or, or I should say not yet seen to be repeaters. And then another prediction is that the burst would be shorter for, uh, or longer depending upon their uh, the, the, the frequency at which they peak, shorter uh, duration for uh, high frequency bursts and longer duration for low frequency bursts. And then uh, you can also expect systematic variations to burst properties. So you, there, there is a brief unstable mass transfer phase, which will be followed by a common envelope uh, phase. And then uh, this unstable mass transfer can give rise to increased luminosity of FRB and common envelope can uh, act as uh, as an additional medium to cause more scattering and increase dispersion measure. And finally, FRBs will uh, turn off from a given source uh, if, 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 if it's coming from an unstable mass transfer uh, phase. Um, you can also perhaps expect a uh, slow radio burst uh, uh, because the burst duration scales with the uh, ISCO and which scales with the mass of the black hole. So perhaps from intermediate mass black holes, the uh, uh, the coherent radio counterparts would be called slow radio bursts that can last for a few hundreds of milliseconds to even a few seconds. Um, yeah, I think I will uh, stop here with uh, leaving this slide here. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so thank you very much, Naveen, for the very interesting talk. Are there any questions for Naveen? I already see a couple of uh, hands raised. So uh, perhaps Andreas, you can start first. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think Naveen, that was a very interesting uh, uh, talk. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, the dispersion measure. So mm -hmm. if if the FRB has to travel through the outflow from the accretion disk, uh, wouldn't you expect uh, increased dispersion measure and also differences in the dispersion measure between uh, observations of repeated FRBs from the same object? Because, uh, because of the precession, we would expect that uh, the FRB will trace different parts of the uh, accretion disk wind. So this would uh, mm -hmm. result in different dispersion measure. Um, you're absolutely right. So. Uh... 
the the cost screw pattern that i show here this corresponds to the efficient disk wins and uh, as you rightly point out the the orientation or the direction uh, through which the frbs pass through uh, will cause some variabilities in the dispersion measure and they can also cause a variability in the rotation measure and we are absolutely right in that uh, however would this dispersion measure be large enough to cause a complete blockade of frb is something that we also look at uh, so the deceleration radius or the shock radius uh, that we show here is different from the frb emission radius um, i'll show an appendix plot here okay so uh, you, for different accre accreting uh, for different mass accretion rates you can expect the outflow coming to be different and they can contribute differently to the dispersion measure and uh, recent observations have shown that the dispersion measure variations are much less than 1 parsec per centimeter cube okay so we want the emission to be somewhere to the left of these bands left of these bands for different uh, mass transfer rates and the radius at which an frb should be produced for different mass transfer rates such that we observe much smaller variation in the dispersion measure is what is calculated in this figure here so uh, the frb should be emitted to the uh, left of these bands and above the solid black line in order to be uh, in order to match the observed observed constraints uh, from frbs and uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah so we can expect such such small variabilities in the dispersion measure and uh, such variabilities are in, in indeed observed from uh, some frbs and our model puts a lower limit on the radius uh, from which frb should be emitted such that uh, it is not hindered by any scattering any indus continent indus in this continent scatterings or uh, or other uh, uh, high op high opacity high opacity medium. Okay, okay, and this leads me actually to the next uh, uh, question. So, mm -hmm. if if you if you associate FRBs with uh, with ULXs and um, uh, ULXs with very particular properties, as you show mm -hmm. uh, here mm -hmm. in this diagram, then mm -hmm. uh, you you can have predictions about uh, the populations of FRBs as a function of redshift. So, mm -hmm. and that you can use in order to compare with the rates of FRBs that are observed uh, overall. Have you tried that? Yes, uh, so we did look into the uh, rates also. And uh, uh, we, we finally do, do that calculation, calculation in our paper and we uh, show that uh, just a small fraction of like 1% of ULXs are needed to make FRBs. Uh, this, takes, this takes into account uh, different uh, redshift effect effects also. Okay, okay, that's very interesting. Yeah. Well, perhaps I can ask a follow-up, a uh, very short follow-up question before I give the stage to uh, Nikki Lafis. Uh, mm -hmm. So given what you said, would you expect to, uh, that uh, any of the like, uh, uh, existing instruments such as a chime they would have already uh, detected frbs from known uh, ulexes i mean does your model make any predictions for how many you would expect from you know, not known sources um so uh I think it would be a little uh, hard to say that without uh, without without having an idea of what the chime catalog is going to contain in it, but um, um, I I don't think I have an answer for that right now. Uh, what fraction of the current sample of FRBs could be produced by UVXs? No, I mean uh, I'm sorry. 
I, I was more thinking about, so you mentioned that uh, you need about 1% of non ULX mm -hmm. to make a fair piece to explain the, to match the, the, the two uh, rates of the two different phenomena. So mm -hmm. uh, how many, uh, is it, I mean, would it be worth looking at known uh, ULXs systematically for, um, to, for, for FRBs? Absolutely, yes. Uh, they, they, uh, we strongly would uh, recommend any uh, systematic campaign to observe uh, at least nearby ULXs uh, with some radio facilities to search for FRBs. Uh, that, that's something that that, that would be very interesting. Okay, thanks. Uh, so next question by Nikki Lafis. So, uh, yeah. Or on the other hand, uh, before uh, this, uh, adding, adding to your previous point, we can also observe nearby FRBs. For example, recently uh, an FRB was detected from M81 at a distance of a few megaparsec, three or four megaparsec, I guess. And mm -hmm. such very short, uh, such very uh, closer FRBs can also be observed with Chandra on a on a long on a long deep uh, observation uh, in order to see if there does exist any FRBs in, in that in that field of view. Um, they would also be very interesting. Mm -hmm. I see, but uh, still, I think you you're not trying to uh, explain all FRBs. With this model, right? Because uh, I mean, the, the galactic, the galactic FRB, we already know that it's not a, a ULX, right? Exactly, exactly. So this is based on the premise that uh, we need at least two progenitors. We need multiple progenitors to explain uh, the current sample of FRBs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, uh, Nikki Lafis, please you can unmute yourself. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes good. Okay. Uh, the, the reason I'm asking is uh, today I'm using for the first time these uh, uh, headphones. So uh, uh, I don't know how exactly how they work. Okay, fine. Everything is fine. Um, I have not understood why you need super endicton accretion. If all you need is a plasmoid to uh, be ejected and create a shock, then this happens all the time in nearly all black hole X-ray binaries when they cross the so-called jet line in the upper left corner of the diagram that you showed, this Q diagram. Uh, mm -hmm. So all, all black hole X-ray binaries mm -hmm. uh, somehow in a way that we do not understand uh, go from a steady jet, steady compact mm -hmm. jet, to a uh, an eruptive an eruptive uh, jet with plasmoids and large gammas. Mm -hmm. So and and they are sub -edicted. So mm -hmm. why why do you need super -edicted? Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so thanks for that question. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll play this little movie here. So what you see here is the formation of the plasmoids that, that you just mentioned here, uh, observed from force-free simulations of, of black hole magnetospheres. The spherical blobs that you see here are the plasmoids, right? And this is what we invoke here to be, uh, yeah, so these spherical blobs. So this is what we invoke here, uh, as the source for the flares that goes and hits onto the upstream steady jet. So why we need uh, super dink and accretion this, this, this. So uh, all the uh, uh, transient flares that are observed from galactic X-ray binaries at least, they uh, they have a Lorentz factor of the order of a, of the order of few dozen, few, few tens at maximum. We have not observed any flares from sub Eddington galactic X-ray binaries with Lorentz factor of the order of a few hundreds. And uh, the luminosity of the flares that are produced, they scale as the accretion luminosity. So we think that perhaps in unobserved systems, like in, 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 in some systems with uh, 
with transient flares not yet observed, um, uh, the, 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 the Lorentz factor of the blobs could be uh, of the order of a few hundred that is required in this scenario to produce an FRB. And such high Lorentz factors can be produced by uh, blobs due to much larger superdington accretion rates. Yep. No, I, I, I don't understand why super addicton will create uh, large gamma, large Lorentz gamma blobs. So first we need uh, large Lorentz factor gamma blobs. And the uh, blobs that we see are, are, are much, the Lorentz factor of the blobs that we see from subdington accretion disks are much smaller. Uh, the luminosity, uh, the, the luminosity of these flares uh, that you see here, the blobs that you see here, they directly correspond to the uh, to the flux of the magnetic field lines that are directed along with along with the accretion disk. And the larger the uh, magnetization is, you can expect the you can expect the bulk motion to be also larger. And larger magnetization can be produced by larger advection of field lines, which can which can be uh, which can be uh, which can happen due to much larger mass transfer rates also. So the luminosity of these blobs are, uh, are seen from simulations to go directly as, uh, as to, are seen to scale directly with the accretion rates of uh, all the mass transfer rates. Okay, uh, th then why don't we, so in order to see fast radio bursts from this mechanism, we need mm -hmm. to look down the jet. Correct. Right? Okay. Then why don't we see FRBs, even huge FRBs, from uh, BLLUX? Um, what do you think would be the? Uh, uh, I don't know much about BLLUX. Uh, I, 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 I don't. More. I don't either. But uh, it, it. I imagine them as as plasmoids coming out with huge gamma. Uh, mm -hmm. and therefore, and producing all sorts of uh, uh, effects and radiation, but you know, why not shocks like this? Uh, are BLX powered by uh, uh, black holes with masses that correspond to the uh, time scale that is required, that is seen from FRBs, that is, that is, is the light crossing time scale of the ISCO of uh, the black holes powering of RBs corresponding to millisecond durations. No, no, the, these are these are yeah. supermassive black holes. Exactly, exactly. So that could be, uh, yeah. So like I said before, uh, the uh, the duration scales as the uh, ISCO, uh, which scales the mass of the black hole. So perhaps the sort of bursts that are seen that can be seen from the LATS are not categorized as fast radio bursts, but there could be some other uh, much slower radio bursts happening of the order of a few seconds that we just do not identify them as fast radio bursts. Hmm. And, and another one reason last... also, yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, one last question. How do you arrange for the magnetic field at the shock to be in the plane of the shock? Um, in 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 in, a, in one of the early slides that you showed, where mm -hmm. you showed the uh, the shock, there it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see mm -hmm. that the magnetic field lines are uh, in the plane of the shock. Mm -hmm. How do you arrange that? Uh, so because the the magnetic field in the jet is typically along the jet, not not perpendicular to it. That's a that's a good point. Um, Yes, but uh, it can also have many cases in which the jet experience, like I said before, the jet is not necessarily always um, a, a sturdy, strong funnel. It is going to be bent along uh, at, at some uh, at some distances due to the um, due to the yeah. So yeah, so it, it is clearly bent as seen from the observations, and it is expected to be bent due due to the. Uh, pressure from the accretion disk winds and also due to the drags. And such bends can cause uh, several uh, twists and turns in the upstream medium, uh, as also seen, observe, 
uh, observationally and uh, and the flares are first emitted along the axis of the jet and they can interact with the field lines that are perpendicular to the Flare. Okay, I I can imagine the magnetic field becoming from from parallel perpendicular perpendicular along the jet. Uh, mm -hmm. If the magnetic field is along the jet, mm -hmm. does the model work or not? Or you no. have if to the, have. We need to the, have the, the yes yes uh, for synchrotron maser to work. You need to have perpendicular uh, magnetic shocks. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. Is there any final question for? Uh, so I see Vasilis and Apostolos want to ask something. So please go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Um, yeah. I, I believe you mentioned that uh, regarding the emission mechanisms that in certain cases the high frequency component of the burst uh, gets produced a, a bit earlier than the uh, low mm -hmm. frequency component. Um, so. I, so the question is, uh, at, what, at what, what, what kind of time scales are we talking about? Because um, if the difference is very, very small in the order of uh, milliseconds, for example, how, how can you distinguish them, um, observationally speaking, from, uh, from dispersion measure? Like uh, distinguish whether what you're observing is actually, um, you know, introduction of uh, like DM from uh, the ASM or the burst itself okay uh that's a that's a very important question i uh, i should i should clarify it so there are two different uh lags that i'm that i'm talking about here one is the top one so what the top plot shows is you have a periodicity of the burst and within this periodicity within this period uh the high frequency or uh, the bursts that peak at high frequencies arrive earlier compared to the bursts that peak at lower frequencies that are later. That, uh, that is one aspect. And the other aspect is concerned with this figure, which is that within a single burst, the high frequency components arrive earlier than the low frequency components. Uh, so the observers uh, figure out the dispersion measure of, uh, of an FRB pulse uh, using different methods. They, they have they have different uh, methods through which they figure out the FRB using uh, structure maximizing functions, and there are different ways. They figure out the dispersion measure, and then they de-disperse the FRB pulse. And what you see here is the de-dispersed FRB pulse. So the scattering that you see here, uh, or I shouldn't say scattering, the the frequency dependent uh, uh, arrival time of different sub packets of bursts. This is seen from B dispersed births. So this one does not have any contribution to the dispersion measure at all. Uh, so this is a purely um, intrinsic effect. Intrinsic in the sense this has to do with the FRB engine, the emission mechanism itself, or just the immediate environment through which the FRB is coming out and not necessarily, and, and this does not have any contribution due to the ISM or IGM. Those effects are all corrected here. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess you're referring to the pulse profile then, the, and the, its structure essentially, R rather than a single burst um, that would be obviously determined by the dispersion measure, judging by the by the curve and things like that. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you please rephrase that? Yes. Yeah, so essentially, you mean that um, when you say that the high frequency components arrive earlier, in, in this case, you're essentially referring to to the pulse profile. Um, and, and it's uh, individual um, sub pulses essentially. Correct, exactly, right. exactly. Okay, okay yeah. thanks. Yeah, and yeah, uh, the duration of these sub packets can be of the order of a fraction of a millisecond um, also. Uh, okay, thanks Apostolos. And uh, I think we're running out of time. So unfortunately I have to stop the conversation here. So thank you Naveen again for the very nice uh, talk and discussion. And we're looking forward to uh, hosting you here in, at the Institute in the future. Uh, it was my pleasure. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Many, many thanks again. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Navin. Bye.